A very good afternoon and welcome to this session titled Preparing for Africa's Growing Global Role. My name is Nzinga Kunda. I'm a business news anchor on the public broadcaster in South Africa, the SABC. And it's my great pleasure to be your program director and moderator as we take a look at how continuing growth and changes in Africa's social and economies will lead to a changing role in global affairs and the global economy. Africa is the youngest and fastest growing continent. By 2035, more young Africans will enter the workforce each year than the whole of the world combined, which brings about major opportunities, but also major challenges. So how can leaders across Africa prepare for these changes and what do they expect from the rest of the world? To answer this and other questions, our panel today is made up of Prime Minister of Cote d'Ivoire, Patrick Ashi, the Chief Executive Officer of NARSPES, Puti Mahanyele Dabengwa, Chairman of Sepla Petroleum, Chukwe Loka Ojiako. If you're watching online or in the room, you can use the hashtag WEF22. We'll be doing a question and answer session a little bit later on as well. So you can share your thoughts with us there. Prime Minister, perhaps I'll begin with you. What's the importance of investment in human capital, healthcare and infrastructure in order to ensure that Sub-Saharan Africa thrives in a post-COVID world? Thank you very much. I think that the issue of human capital uh, start to arise when you think about development. And you look around the world, uh, how people and countries have been able to leapfrog uh, on these 30 or 40 past years, you know, what was the, 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 you know, what did they use as, you know, main goals? And, 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 and you realize that uh, when you take a country like Singapore, it's a, just a rock in the middle of the ocean. And look at how they have turned into one of the biggest economy of the world. What do they have? And you realize that it's just human capital. If you're able to have a, a good human capital, you're going to have the right people, good education. Uh, you can do, you know, any dream is possible. Uh, you bring back, you know, in Africa and look what has been going on in the past, you know, 40 to 50 years or 60 years that we've been independent. Uh, I mean, the major issue is human capital, you know. Uh, wherever you've been able to educate your people uh, to have the right leadership, meaning with the right people, then you've been able to achieve great things. Mm. So today, uh, when we work on what we call our 2030 vision, uh, we went all over the world to see, you know, why do we stand here right now after 50 years and we're not further down the line on the development issue and realize that, you know, human capital was the biggest challenge that we're facing. And you said it, you put it right. It's a huge opportunity, but it could be also a huge threat if this youth is not educated and if you cannot insert them in a professional life. Mm -hmm. you know, then it becomes a threat. And actually, uh, uh, in our situation where the northern part of the country is, you know, uh, we have terrorism going on over there. These kids, if they don't can find a job and they get desperate, can just throw themselves in the hands of the terrorists. Or some of them can just throw themselves in the ocean and try to immigrate somewhere. So your biggest asset, which is the one that you're going to use to develop, if you're not able to train them properly and to give them the right job that will help them give the best of themselves, then there's no way you can achieve anything. Mm -hmm. So yes, we're putting a lot of money in education. We're uh, putting a lot of money in building schools. You're putting a lot of, we're putting a lot of money in uh, paying uh, uh, the salary of the trainers, and all that is a huge investment. Now, to be able to do this huge investment, you need to get money from somewhere, and that's where the private sector comes. If you do not have a huge private sector that can really hire these kids, then you're also in trouble. The administration in my country, for instance, each year, 400,000 kids get out of school with or without a degree. The administration can hire only 15,000 of them. The 385,000, where do you put them? In the private sector. Now, if does, the private sector doesn't grow fast enough, then they are on your hands, you know, and it becomes a very key issue. And the easy way for them to find a job in the private sector is to be very well trained. 
So, you know, training is the biggest chance, you know, for the private sector to come because they will find kids that are well trained to grow their business. This private sector will generate revenues for the state and the state will use this revenue to build school and get education to their kids. It's just the way it works. So wherever you take it, education, mainly for the use, is the way forward as far as development is concerned. Put it to two of the points that the Prime Minister raised, one about the ability of technology to leapfrog, and two about the role of the private sector. In Africa, it's a sector that you operate in. Are we innovating quickly enough to realize some of the opportunities that are there? Thank you very much, Nzinga. And um, I think absolutely, as, as you say, um, it's such a critical issue. Um, you know, the Prime Minister spoke about the importance of ensuring that our youth are educated. And that is something that, as a technological business, we have been very focused on. And so we have a number of initiatives that are focused on empowering young people. And so from that perspective, we have an entity called NASPIS Labs, which is focused on providing education as well as access to jobs for young people. And so just if I look at just this past financial year, um, we were able to provide access to employment to over 2,000 young people, um, as well as access to you know, um, education as well, digital education. And the importance of this is that these are young people who go from being at home, having no opportunities, to suddenly having access to opportunities in various roles. It could be roles um, as you know, software t uh, developers or you know, technicians or you know, cybersecurity technicians, various roles that they can play in. And from that perspective, can start to play a meaningful role in the continent. And the importance of being able to develop these skills is that beyond the continent, they can play a role globally. Because one of the things that we've seen in various discussions is the fact that you know, one of the demographic dividends that we have on the African continent is our youth. And so to the extent that we can leverage that globally, it is something that will be to the benefit of both the youth as well as um, other countries as well. And so if, if I look at the work that we are doing in ensuring that we support young people, 62% of that is females. Um, it's not because I'm a woman. <laughs> okay, it is. <laughs> but, but, you know, for us, it's something that, that is critically important. And I think one of the reasons why we've also looked at this is the fact that when you look at WEF's uh, regional risks for doing business 2020, over the last two years, you'll see that unemployment as well as underemployment, is, those are the biggest risks that we've had over the last two years. And so it's important that we're able to tackle this issue very, very well. And the best way we can do that is by ensuring that we're providing digital skilling to young people because we can do this, they can do this in their homes, wherever they are, um, as, as long as they have access to cyber. Okay. You know, yeah. Chukwadoka, we're speaking quite a lot about technology and the ability for it to leapfrog and offer opportunities on the continent. But it's very difficult to do that if there's not adequate access to energy. Just speak to me about that. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, thank you for having me and, and His Excellency and uh, uh, Puta have actually made very valid points, especially around leveraging the importance of the, democratic, uh, de the demographic dividends for Africa continent. Mm -hmm. for, from our perspective, being a company that is in the energy sector, we have taken the ESG, environment, social, and, and governance to be the real soul of our business. And in doing this, you, we, we've also prioritized socials. And in doing that, we're completely aligned with what both His Excellency and Buddha have spoken about. So in targeting technology, in targeting anything you can do to leapfrog Africa development and to play the right role, there is no way you can do this with the level of energy poverty in Africa. Think about it, over 700 million people in the world are in darkness, no power, no access to electricity. Over 600 million of these people are in Africa. If you also take that further, the energy access is not just about switching on the light and switching off. It is the important tool 
that will completely transform the industries, even the digital technology we're talking about, the education, which I believe should be completely retooled for, for the purposes of development. Now, when we talk about energy and access to energy, and we, we by the way, is the uh, Sustainable Development Goal 7, as a company, what we then decided to do is that to be able to create the environment to employ the youth, you have to have access to electricity, not just to fire the big industries, but to fire the small and medium scale industries. And this impacts very strongly in socials and create the entrepreneurs that will employ the youth. And then just to give you some statistics, in Nigeria, for example, unemployment rate is over 33% and growing. For a, con a country of over 200 million people, per capita source of electricity, 150 megawatt hour. Total generated electricity in Nigeria, for example, is about 12,000 megawatts for the grid. Off-grid supplies by diesel, and this is as high as 25,000 megawatts. If you compare this with the global average of 2,500 kilowatt hour, you see the real huge opportunity to invest further in, in electricity and provide that to, 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 to the uh, general society and to be able to use that to create the prosperity and, 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 and uh, employment that is required. Now, if you also take that further, energy in the households, not only do you need this for electricity like I spoke about? The real issue is that the biggest demand for energy in household is cooking. And if you look at what is happening in cooking in, in most homes, 2.5 billion people over the world are having very unhealthy source of energy for cooking. Over a billion of these are in Africa. So what we've also decided to do as a company is to deepen our involvement and investment in the midstream part of our business, which then identifies gas as a transition fuel. And this is both gas to power, gas to industry, and gas to the homes. So we're working hard to displace all the diesel in, in the homes, displace the household kerosene, displace the coal and the charcoal in homes, and bring in LPG, which is a cleaner form of energy from gas. And that not only creates and pro provides cleaner environment, it also protects the, the, the households from, from the fumes and the health hazard that is associated with it. So anything you do, even technology, digital technology and everything cannot happen with the level of access to electricity, which is extremely poor in the Africa continent. Okay, Prime Minister, if we skip forward and we implement a lot of resolutions and we have a well-functioning, capacitated Africa, that would expand access to global markets, it would improve um, public service delivery, increase transparency and accountability, and also create some of the jobs that we've been speaking about. What would you say is the most important tool for moving us to where we are now, to that Africa? Uh uh, so we are concerned about a couple of years ago, uh, head of state, President Alassane Ouattara, asked us to think about uh, what will be 10 years down, 2030, and to backtrack and try to see what happened to the country, uh, how it's been developing on the past 50 years, and look around. Well, most of the countries that have been able to leapfrog, what, what really was the secret? What, what was the tools? that they use to move so fast. And we, we went all over the world, and we went to Asia, mainly Southeast Asia, Vietnam, Malaysia, uh, so on and so forth. And when we, we, we pay a close attention to some of these countries who potentially, I'm talking about Arab land, about human capital, about, you know, were almost at the same level that we were 50 years ago, and are that way beyond us today, we realized that there were really two key major issues that we put in our vision as two uh, paradigm shift. The first one is private sector. You know, the administration sometimes in our countries are so powerful, so heavy, that at the end of the day, people think that the administration has its own money, they finance road, they finance school, they finance health, they finance everything, and the private sector is aside. In fact, to tell the truth, the Public sector has nothing to do with the private sector because for the private sector, there's a market. If there is demand, then they have the business. They go to the bank, they get money, they do the business, they get a product, they sell the product, export or just sell in the national market. It doesn't work like that. You realize that uh, 
there's no way you can get developed if the state doesn't play a leading role. They are the ones who know what are the key sectors that's going to drive growth sustainably in the long term. Now, now it's not just making an enabling environment that makes someone uh, you know, st sitting down somewhere in downtown Los Angeles come all the way to Abidjan. You know, there's more than that. And you realize that these countries have made the development of the private sector as important as the development of infrastructure, of school, education, and health. Once you have identified this key strategic sector that is going to help your country grow, then you see how you attract investors locally and inter internationally. And you work you work hand to hand with them from the beginning. Do they have the right technology? Do they have the right uh, human capacity? Do they, uh, can they really produce at a very competitive price? How can we do? Sometimes you have specific policy for specific sector. For instance, talking about the textile, talking about some other in, in, in industry, the state is playing a role. Even going as far as finding a market outside for them the state is playing a sector. But, you know, so if you don't make the private sector, you know, the most important things in your country, there's no way you can get there. Just saying the private sector is the engine of growth and then you stop there, forget about it. Just saying that I've put an enabling infrastructure or an enabling environment is not enough. Those who have succeeded really sometimes, you don't know where the state stopped and the private sector starts. It's just, you know, both interests. Because if you don't have a private sector growing very fast, how do you generate the revenue that will help you build school, uh, develop health center, develop road? You're going to go through debt. But then how do you reimburse the debt? At the end of the day, whatever you do, the private sector is really the one that is going to generate revenue for you to be developed. Second, we're talking about employment. We're talking about, uh, you know, uh, demographic, demographic divide, you know. We, in 2030, are going to have 8 million kids ready, out of school, to get a job. Where are we going to put them? This is my question. If you don't put, somewhere, you put, don't put them somewhere where they feel that they have a decent life, they become a threat to you. Most of the crisis that you see in Africa and over the world, the core cause comes from the fact that kids are desperate. They don't know what to do. They don't know where to go. They don't have a decent life. Anyone who comes and tell any crazy story to them, they follow them. So you are talking about the kids, uh, the education. Employment is the biggest challenge that the continent will face in the next decades coming. And one of the biggest solutions is help your private sector grow by all means. Second thing, governance. The private sector will never grow in an environment where you have a good governance, an administration that is very efficient, that know what it should do, and that consider the private sector of, you know, as one of the things which is most, most important you know, for them. And second, who is fighting against corruption. Corruption is a cancer for the private sector. So most of these countries that have succeeded have done these two things made everything possible for the private sector to grow as fast as possible. And second, develop good governance, a very efficient administration, and administration that fight every single day against corruption. Now, just to do you just two examples. Now, we in Cote d'Ivoire, the first world producer of cocoa, two million tons, the first world producer of cashew nut, the fourth world producer of rubber, the uh, you know, second largest producer of cotton, each of these raw material, we don't transform locally. Cotton, 95% is export. Cashew nut, Vietnam is buying 75% of our cashew nut raw, and India, 15%. We just 10% left to be transformed, so on and so forth. Now, you realize that you get money when you increase the added value, when you can integrate yourself in the value, the world value chain. I take, for instance, the cocoa today, the whole value chain of the cocoa going from the farm get all the way to the consumer is $138 billion. I don't get me, who is the first world producer of the raw material, $8 billion. $130 billion is just outside of my country. If I can just increase by 20% the added value, 
I can increase in an extra year my own GDP by 75%. It changed the whole game. Sure. If I take cotton, 95% of the cotton is exported, and I import fabrics. And, and I can go on force and force, you know that. So the issue is create private sector, increase added value that will help you create job in an environment where you have a good governance. So when we're speaking about threats, let's come back to energy. We also know that climate change poses a threat to many countries in the region. What coping mechanisms does the continent need to begin to implement? And when it comes to energy, what are the challenges? And I'm going to ask you to make this quite a brief answer so we can have a question and answer session with the audience as well. Th thank you very much. Uh, first of all, climate. Uh, climate action has dominated the discussion uh, all over the world, and rightly so. And frankly, one of the things that comes to mind is how does this impact Africa? Obviously, Africa is very uh, negatively impacted. You're beginning to have serious flooding. You're beginning to have even overwarming and, and the rest of them. You're having drought and, and desert encroachment and the rest of them. But one very important point, and I'll relate this to energy, is the fact that indeed Africa contributes only about 3% of the global carbon dioxide and greenhouse emissions. Therefore, when you talk about energy supply and we hear things like gas and fossil fuels should not be developed and invested in, that indeed becomes even more inimical to Africa. So from our perspective, we're looking at how do you take out these emissions from the climate? Therefore, we're looking at technology in the energy industry, if you look at the upstream today, there are available technology and innovation that will do carbon capture and sequestration to take away the carbon that is emitted. In our com company, for example, we've taken a view to take away all of the flaring of gas and the rest of them in our business. So in Nigeria, for example, the government put a policy to take out a, 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 a flaring by 2030. We took a, del a deliberate decision to make it 2020. The next thing we've also done is to capture the carbon in the atmosphere. We launched what we call Tree for Life. Tree for Life is basically creating a very important carbon sink that will enable us to take a lot of that out. And that creates employment because we are going to be employing quite a lot of youths to do this. The next thing, of course, uh, uh, when we speak about uh, uh, the climate is to make sure that Africa also aligns with what uh, His Excellency has just spoken about, to create the environment for the private sector to really thrive and use that to... I see that you, you, you want us to ask Thanks. some questions. Thanks. Putty's but, got but a minute or less, a, uh, a minute or so. Yeah. I would just like to talk to us about closing gender gaps. You spoke about women a little bit earlier on. In terms of access to education and opportunities, what is the role of tech and the private sector in that in Africa? You can just add to what the Prime Minister said. Yes, I actually, thank you very much, Nzing. I actually wanted to add to what the Prime Minister said. I think the Prime Minister raised a very important issue which speaks to the importance of entrepreneurship. And that's an area that's very critical for us. So within our company, we have the NASPAS Foundry, which is investing into um, early stage businesses. And so from that perspective, what we do is that we provide capital equity funding towards these businesses. But in addition to that, we also provide a lot of support to ensure that these businesses can grow. It is through entrepreneurship that we can see our economies grow because if you look at all our economies, we know that it's entrepreneurs that are growing our businesses. And so from that perspective, it, it's something that's very important. And in addition to that, through our platform, Take A Lot in South Africa, we have entrepreneurs who had no business before COVID. And by being on that platform, immediately had access to millions of customers that they were able to provide digital, pro you know, their products to in a, in a digital mechanism. And so, from that perspective, it, it just shows the importance of the role of being able to reach out to entrepreneurs and support them if we are talking about growth um, on the African continent. And then, obviously, from a woman perspective, I think, you know, women are drivers. Of, of businesses, they are drivers of, of our economies. And so the extent to which we can ensure that we're providing access to capital to them, as well as access to information that they require in growing their business is, is so important if we are looking at growing our economies on the continent.
Thank you, and thank you for the succinct answer. I'd now like to go to the floor and take questions. Please lift up your hand. I think a mic is going to come towards you. If you're going to direct your question to someone specific, please let us know who that is so we can answer, get the questions answered as quickly as possible. All right, you can give the gentleman in the front there. If Thank we can you. get a second mic, if it's possible, so that we can move it along quite quickly. Yes, please. Thank you. Ahead. My name is Adam, and I'm from Kotonou Benin, the Global Shipper. Um, I would like to raise awareness on the fact that food is now becoming the number one priority when it comes to geopolitics. And I'm amazed that Africa comes together, and we are talking, but I'm not hearing anything about intra-Africa trade, and we have 60% of the arable land on the earth. If we could trade among ourselves, we could be sustainable, and then we could solve, we could actually like, prof, like get solution for the rest of the world. I would like to know what you guys think about that. Thank you. Thank you. If I can have one person answering that question. Can you go? Uh, thank, thank you so very much. I think, Adam, that is a very valid question. Africa, intra-Africa trade, and that's why I was happy when His Excellency spoke about the governments and leadership. Intra-Africa trade is very appalling, less than 12% within Africa. And if you look at the Africa continent as well, agriculture is the mainstay of that economy. And what is really going on is that quite a lot of the food gets perished. It's not adequately processed, the lack of industries and the rest of them. So encouraging intra-Africa trade is critical. And I think the Africa Union launched what they call the intra-Africa trade-free zone. But we need to see this leapfrogged into making sure that there is really improvement in that intra-Africa trade. Now, talking about food, from our perspective, it is very clear the Africa population is growing. It's expected to be about 2 billion by 2050. That means many more mouths need to be fed. And from our perspective, it then means that gas to power, gas to industry, gas to agriculture has become even more critical and, and urgent. That is why we keep talking about gas being the transition uh, fuel for, for, for Africa that will help leapfrog the growth. Now, in Africa, I keep hearing fastest growing economy and the rest of them. But when you then take the finite size of African economy, you realize that at the level of growth we are today, Africa will not be able to catch up with the role that it needs to play in the global economy. So you'd like to see Africa grow in leaps and bounds, not even by 10% or two, but in real great multiples exponentially for us to be able to catch up. And food security is critical to this. Just Amen. before we take the second question, please may I ask that when you ask the question, you stand up so that we can also get you on camera. That was a request there, Putin. Mm. Yeah, I just wanted to add that one of we also have invested in agri-tech businesses. Um, in fact, just two weeks ago, we invested in a business called Nile, which is providing support to both significant um, you know, uh, farmers of, of, of businesses as well as industrial players in, in the agri space. Um, and so we, you know, in addition to Nile, we also invested in a business called uh, Aerobotics, um, which gets 50% of its revenue from the US. So, you know, being able to invest in agriculture is, is something that is, is very, very important uh, for the continent um, as, as, as we move forward. Mm. All right, the next question. And then if we can get a mic to the three people with their hands up here and the one person with their hands up here. Please go ahead. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for the panel. My name is Ntavi Singh. I run a solar company in West Africa. And I'm really glad you mentioned the 700 million. Um, the International Energy Association projects that we need 100 million people electrified uh, every year up until 2030 to leave no one behind. But with the stated um, energy policies that have actually been announced by most governments um, and, gov and uh, companies, it's projected that 682 million people will still be without power in 2030. 85% of those will be in Africa. Okay. We've seen massive electrification programs in Asia. Um, so going from 67% to 97% um, from 2000 to 2019. Why are we not seeing the same level of commitments and sort of mainstreaming of energy access? We know it's 35, million, $35 billion a year needed. The numbers are out there. It's 2% of global energy investment. Why are we not... like? How do, you, how, how do we even talk about private sector or you know, quality of life if still 80% of 682 yep. million people will be in the dark? Thank you. 
I speak to this as well. Yes. Frankly, what is even more worrying is not just that there is no access to electricity, but it is the real act, like, activism to stop the investment in fossil fuels. I keep telling people that zero or net zero carbon is not the same as net zero fossil fuels. For Africa continent sitting on a lot of gas reserves, well over, in Nigeria, for example, have over 200 trillion cubic feet of gas. It will be absolutely, absolute madness not to develop that gas to give access to electricity. So I believe that this investment flow must happen. Even in Europe, if you have followed recently what has happened, Europe has then changed its policy and has added additional one decade for gas utilization for energy in Europe. They're beginning to use coal, they're beginning to use diesel. Why then should Africa not take the right advantage of using the gas that is in abundance? While, of course, making sure that we use cleaner energy and, and attracting investment. So my message there is the very huge investment capital that is available for energy, a lot of it should also go into gas used as, as transition fuel to close that right. gap. Just Thank would you. like to check around. Let's take a question from this side of the room and then we'll go back to that side. The gentleman over here in the Navy suit has his hand up. If we can get a mic to him. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Kwame Bachwe. I am a global shaper as well. Um, I have a question specifically directed at His Excellency. Um, you spoke a lot about attracting investment to Africa. And we know that a lot of companies that want to do business in certain geographies are looking at two primary things. Um, one is talent, and then the other one is um, ease of doing business. In this room alone, I see a lot of um, young global leaders and global shapers in this room that are really talented. Um, and are scattered across the um, diaspora, the African diaspora. The specific question I have is that in your government, for instance, and perhaps that could be an example for other African leaders, how are you engaging young talent in leadership, in fostering that intergenerational leadership that would inspire other young, talented Africans that are in the diaspora to come home and put their hands to the wheel in building the continent that we want to see? Thank you. Thank you very much. Just one word about them. Uh, uh, issue of uh, uh, food, and then and I'll jump on this question, then because it is a link about it, you know. Uh, yes, you have arable land, but arable, arable land is just not all of it. Modernization of the agriculture is really the biggest issue, because when you have an agriculture where you don't use water irrigation, you don't use high yield seeds, you don't use mechanization, you don't need uh, use new uh, uh, agricultural uh, uh, techniques, then your yield is so low and you don't have productivity. Whatever you grow is not competitive. You cannot even sell it outside and even inside imported goods are even much cheaper. People are producing in a very archaic method very often. So it's a very key issue. Second is the private sector, I mean people growing foods, cannot invest in all these infrastructure Irrigation is an investment, uh, you know, uh, doing the research to have, uh, you know, uh, uh, very high yield seeds or plants, uh, mechanization, you know. If people have to invest in all that, then there's also an issue of cost, you know. So government has to be involved in every single country where agriculture has grown really fast and people have been very performant, country and state have invested heavily in you know, irrigation in mechanization, then the private sector take over. But if you're just crossing arms and waiting for people to be doing everything, your arable land, land will stay there. Just an example, Vietnam, they're producing 40 million tons of rice, 30, 330,000 square kilometers. I can show you some countries in Africa one million uh, uh, square kilometers Arab land. They don't produce two million tons of rice. Now, Vietnam has invested in 7,000 irrigation system, the government, for the private sector. So if you cross finger and think that things are going to happen like that, that's why I say you will never have a fast growing private sector if the government doesn't take its role. Just building road, building school, building a, a, a high you know, a health center is not enough. You have to tell yourself that all over the world, 
wherever private sector has grown, the hands of the state were there. Now, people want to convince the, us that you shouldn't go to the private sector. You're the regalian state, just stay there and do the road, educate people, give them health, and cross finger and watch the private sector, they will just grow <laughs> because there's demand. This is the, the okay, why I say the first paradigm shift. Open your eyes. Every single time a private sector is just going bankrupt, the state is coming. I don't want to name a state. But as far as the concern, when we are given money, we're lending, you know, we're borrowing money, people say, you borrow money for that. But leave the private sector alone. They can access credits, and now I come to you. Now, what are you, what are your pitfalls? What are the bottlenecks as you want to do business? First of all, you want to have an enabling environment that helps you have your paper very quick, administration. Now you want to access technology. You want to have either technology transfer or, you know, some people educated that has the knowledge that you can hire to do it, or yourself, you have the knowledge. Then you want to access credit. Access credit at a very you know, cheap condition, at a very accessible condition, because if the credit is so too high, then you cannot afford to reimburse it. Then the state is not there. Then you go to a commercial bank, and you start to talk about your business. You talk, you talk, they listen to you talking. After you finish to describe all your business, they start to ask you about your guarantee. You house, you have a house, you have a car, you have anything you have, and then you turn back and you go because you have none of that. If someone is not there to have a guarantee funds to back you up, you know, mm -hmm. you're not gonna make it. And sometimes you make it and you wanna sell the product. I know state that go in somewhere, in the country somewhere, and that are looking for market for the private sector. When people are selling plane and all over the place, you think that the, the guy who is manufacturing the plane is the one who is going with his plane in all, each of these countries and selling 100 planes? No. The head of state is going there. It's a state visit. And after that, you see the head of state signing a contract for 100 planes. State has not built the plane. <laughs> so, and you know, you go to, to, to Los Angeles and you see Moroccan uh, 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 orange. You think that the, 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 the farmer Somewhere south in Morocco, who's produced your orange, took his plane to downtown Los Angeles to sell it. No, the state is there. They're helping, organizing people, going, uh, the ambassador is going there, negotiating. So there will never be a growing private sector, which is the only one who can hire people and the youth that we have educated, that will generate revenue, that will increase our GDP and help us grow if the state is not backing up. Yes, there is a program to back up the youth, you know, which is one-stop shop that will help people create the company, that will help people get the proper training, that will help people get access to credit, and that will help people sell. Okay. The whole line. Then, after that, they grow by themselves, they grow by themselves, and they become big. That's the way it works. Thank if you. anyone else tells you something else, <laughs> they are misleading. <laughs> Do what they do, don't do what they say. <laughs> we have five minutes left on our panel, and I'd like to ask that when we're asking the questions, we're not doing commentary, we're asking a quick question, and from the panel, we're trying to wrap up the answers in a minute or less, so we can have everybody on the floor getting their questions answered. Are we in agreement? Yes. Okay. Please pass the mic around. You can have. Uh, My name is Ndidi Okonkwo Muneli. I'm an entrepreneur in the food and agriculture sector in Africa. So I have a number of initiatives. And I'm sure I'll like to have a commentary with the Prime Minister after this. But I have two questions. The if, first we can just, one, if I can just ask for one, one so that we can get worry. as many people as possible. Thank you. So the first one is that there's a need for narrative change about Africa. And I've started a new initiative called Changing Narratives Africa. Yeah. Um, and I think we, as Africans, have to lead that narrative change, right? And so one of my questions, you've talked about all the countries doing all the great work. We have entrepreneurs who have products that are ready for the global market, right? Most people don't know that your cocoa, when they eat a chocolate bar, that it's from Cote d'Ivoire. I've been doing that, trying to. What can we do as governments to actually start playing that role of being ambassadors Thank you. for Africa as opposed to naysayers about the realities on the ground. Thank you. If I can ask for a very brief response, as I can see at least four more hands and we have <laughs> four more minutes left. I can answer. Yes. yes. Yeah. I think that uh, the state uh, and the government has just to 
understand that uh, he is the private sector. He is the one who is doing the marketing. If you want to do the marketing alone, it will be very difficult. If I just stay there and, you know, thinking that the farmers who are producing the cocoa are the ones that I should look over and the one who is going to do transformation, who is going to sell it, you know, elsewhere in the world with my name on that, they are going to do it alone, it will never work. So we have to get engaged. We have to get committed. We have to back you up. We have to go together in a marketing or a tool, whatever, you know, workshop and, and road shows to, to market our own name with our private sector. That's what Thank every you. single private today. sector of countries does. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Just a quick the, comment there. There is a very important point around policy change. I think Africa leaders should stop exporting unfinished products. Mm -hmm. to process food Thank you. and make it a policy issue. Very briefly, your question. Uh, hello, my name is Rashid Oblea from Ghana, uh, working on the challenge of housing for the urban youth in Africa. Okay. Um, we've had a lot of inputs on here, and what we have not heard is how we are going to house the nearly 300 million uh, youth who will be coming on board by 2030. Uh, you made reference to entrepreneurship, and that's very valid. But what entrepreneurship needs is the fact that you will be able to take sort of chances. And if you do not have a place to live, an affordable place to live, this is quite difficult. Just a comment from you. Um, what is the perspective, basically, from your side? Thank you. Try and be quick. With it. Putty? Is that directed at Putty? Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a very valid question. Um, and, you know, I, I think the, the important thing is to really try to ensure that you're providing as much support as you can to the entrepreneurs that, that you're dealing with. Um, and so from that perspective, that is why we are not just looking at just providing capital, but also ensuring that we are providing overall um, access to, to, to support to entrepreneurs. And so I think it's, 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 it, it is a, it's a broader issue. But uh, what are you saying? Good, yeah? For the Prime Minister? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. I think yeah. that, yeah. you know, the very important issue as, uh, as we, we're talking is that uh, building houses is not what is difficult is building houses that are affordable to the majority, which means building houses that most of the people in the country can afford. And that goes to how, because you have to borrow the money to go and get it. You know, at which condition can you borrow money? Here, you can get money, for instance, you know, in, in Europe as well, 30 years, you know, uh, uh, and two years grace period, uh, one, two percent. Now, you get in Africa, we're talking about six, seven percent, 15 years. You know, you know, whatever is the cost of the house, it will not be affordable, but just to a few handful people, 10% of the population. So at the end of the day, you have first to access cheap money. You know, grace period, long-term perspective, and, you know, very low rate, and this is the, the issue. We are not able so far to access the money. As long as we will not be able to access that, you can have entrepreneurs, people can build all over the places, we have a lot of land to build, the need is everywhere, but we cannot access it. So what we're doing right now is that we're going all over the world to look for you know, financial resources that match with the need of the majority of our people in order for them to get Thank you. you know, houses, houses. Right. So we've actually reached the almost the end of our panel. I'm going to be taking a chance here and saying that I'm going to wrap up the panel. And if our panelists could stay behind a little bit later on and engage with people, that would be incredible because I think there's a lot of answers and comments that still need to come from the audience. And my apologies for those of you who didn't get their questions in. Thank you so much for your time and your insights on our panel today. We can see that there's so many issues that need to be unpacked. I think the one that comes up the most is that we are the solutions that we are looking for. We have them all in our continent. It's now about working together with the different sectors to ensure that the basics are in place in order to move our continent forward. Thank you so much for your insights as well into the importance of the private sector and collaboration. Our panel today made up of Prime Minister of Cote d'Ivoire, Patrick Ashi, Chukwe Loka Orijako is the chairman of Seplat Petroleum and the chief executive officer of NASPAS, Puti Mahangele Dabengwa. Thank you so much. You've been an incredible audience. Good afternoon.